Hello everybody, this is Dr. Ipshita. Welcome back to my channel. In the last two videos about myasthenia gravis, we have learned about the etiopathogenesis and the different tests, whether in OPD setting or otherwise, to come to a diagnosis of myasthenia gravis. So now we need to learn about the treatment aspects of myasthenia. So how do we treat it? Treatment can be either medical management or surgical management. Therapies include acetylcholinesterase inhibitors, we can use immunosuppressions, then symptomatic treatment of the different ocular abnormalities, avoidance of agents that worsen the neuromuscular transmission, and in some cases, thymectomy. So the first one, acetylcholinesterase inhibitors. They act by preventing the degradation of acetylcholine. So, they provide symptomatic improvement in muscle weakness. Rapid effectiveness and lack of long-term side effects makes this the first line of management. Pyridostigmine is the most commonly used drug. It has a duration of action of 2 to 8 hours. It is most useful for the treatment of systemic weakness of myasthenia gravis and may not improve the diplopia. The usual starting dose is 30 to 60 mg every 4 hours while the patient is awake. Larger doses or more frequent dosing intervals may be used. However, above 120 mg every 3 hours, no additional effectiveness is likely and a risk exists of cholinergic crisis. The most common side effects for these agents are gastrointestinal disturbances like nausea, diarrhea, cramping and muscle twitching. Overdose results in sialuria blurred vision and worsening weakness that is cholinergic crisis next is immunosuppressants like corticosteroids so daily low dose of prednisolone or alternate day dosing uh, gives fewer side effects than a everyday dosing or high doses so corticosteroid monotherapy may reduce the risk of generalization in a patient with only ocular myasthenia gravis the risk of long-term prednisone administration includes peptic ulcer, osteoporosis, femoral neck fracture, diabetes, skin breakdown, weight gain, and Cushing-White features. Immunomodulators like azathioprine, cyclosporin, and mycophenolate morphetil are utilized for the long-term management of myasthenia gravis and may be used in combination with prednisone and pyridostigmine. These medications have fewer long-term side effects compared with steroid. Rituximab is reserved for patients with severe disease. Blood counts, liver function and renal function must be monitors when, monitored when patients are put on immunomodulators. The surgical aspect, thymectomy. It is indicated for all patients who have a thymoma. Thymectomy is beneficial for patients with acetylcholine receptor antibody positive myasthenia gravis. Seronegative or ocular myasthenia gravis thymectomy is done if the disease is refractory to the standard immunotherapy. In myasthenic crisis, plasmapheresis, that is rapid but transient improvement happens if plasmapheresis is done. Preoperatively for thymectomy in patients who have severe weakness, also plasmapheresis can be done. Immunoglobulin produces rapid improvement through a difficult period of myasthenic weakness. That the dosage 400 mg per kg per day for 5 days. Aggressive respiratory support often need intubation and mechanical ventilation and are best managed in the ICU. Coming to ocular aspect of treatment, ptosis typically responds to treatment but diplopia may be refractory. For ptosis, we can, use, we can use lid crutches, lid taping. And ptosis surgery is only done when it is stable over long periods and refractory to other treatment. The diplopia aspect needs patching, prism therapy, and strabismus surgery is inappropriate in active myasthenia gravis. So what do we need to avoid? Medications that lower the safety factor of neuromuscular transmission. Penicillin causes a myasthenic syndrome due to autoantibody production. Antibiotics decrease the production or release of acetylcholine like aminoglycoside agents including streptomycin, neomycin, canomycin, gentamicin. 
then bacitracin, polymyxines, both polymyxine A and B and cholestin, and the monobasic amino acid antibiotics like lincomycin and clindamycin. Iodinated contrast dye administration is to be avoided. Neuromuscular blocking agents such as botulinum toxin, curare, and other depolarizing agents should be used with caution in patients of myasthenia gravis. Chloroquine, lithium, and magnesium affects both presynaptic and postsynaptic transmission. Antiarrhythmic agents, including procanamide and quinidine, can cause or worsen myasthenia gravis. Phenytoin, beta blockers, cisplatin, phenothiazines, statins, and tetracyclines may have similar effects. So, what's the course and outcome of this disease? It is seldom fatal. Remission or good control of symptoms with treatment is possible. Only ocular symptoms and signs at onset. 10 to 20% undergo spontaneous remission and 50 to 80% develop generalized disease almost always, almost within a two, two year period of onset of the disorder. The majority of the patients who continue to have only ocular symptoms two years after presentation never really develop generalized disease. Death in myasthenia gravis is rare and is usually due to respiratory failure with secondary cardiac dysfunction. That's all we need to know about myasthenia. Thank you so much for listening to me. If you like this video, please hit the like button, share it with your friends and colleagues and do subscribe to my channel if you haven't already. Thank you.